Hi guys, and welcome to our second week thinking about dependency parsing. So last week we covered constituency parsing and we looked at how to build parse trees. And then we ended briefly by talking about why verbs are special and they're the focus of most dependency parsing systems. From here, let's now talk about how to dependency parse automatically with Spacey and then how to train our own models. So parsing with Spacey actually is fairly easy. So we can get our dependency sentence using our preset NLP function that we pull in from the base English model without too much work. And remember, this also does entity recognition, part of speech tagging, and so on, because the English model has all of the parts. So we would import Spacey. And then from import Spacey, we're also going to import Displacey, or display, for our dependency parsing. I'm going to show us here a sentence, US unveils world's most powerful supercomputer. In that, we should see the US come up as a geopolitical entity, right? Oh, I'm sorry. That was the last section. That's NER. I'm sorry. We should see how the words are all connected together. Uh, for dependency parsing, um, what we'll see is the noun, um, the US here will be tied to the verb. And then world's most powerful, so an adjective phrase, and that'll be tied to supercomputer. Supercomputer will then be tied back to the verb because the verb, remember, is special. Okay. We're gonna load the English language module and run our NLP on it, which will also include <laughs> the named entity recognition. All right, so we can print this out. And this is like from the book, kind of a cute printout. I think this Lacey's version is better. But a, a quick printout here, and this kind of also shows you, if you're not familiar with Python, how to print in sort of pretty formatting. So for each token in the sentence, we're going to fill in 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And we're going to fill it in with the text, the part of speech tag, the dependency label tag, the head word, right, and its head tag. So each word is printed, US and Bale's most powerful, powerful supercomputer. The head word, meaning what it's connected to, right? This is the child word. And so unveils is tied to a, um, to the US, right? Unveils then uh, has world, world tied to it. So we can kind of see um, some of the dependency labels here but I think the version from Displacey is much better. Now, I will warn you that when you are printing these in Markdown, you do have to label your chunk with a results equals as is. Okay. So when we look at that chunk here, okay, what you'll see is here in the, the head of the chunk, you need to make sure you add this results equals as is. And what that do, what it'll do is print out the chunk correctly. As you are running this stuff in line, this will not display. It'll show you a bunch of gobbledygook. If you do not put in the results equals as is, it will also print out the, the gobbledygook. Okay, it's an SVG file. And this um, header chunk option forces it to show as a picture rather than the code for the picture. So be sure you fix that picture formatting for your homework. And the graph will not display in line. You will have to knit it to see it. Okay. So what the code is, displacy.render, put in the sentence or the paragraph or whatever you have um, processed. Here, these options just change um, how far apart the words are, how big the arrow is, and the arrow width. Uh, and these numbers, probably given that I'm now looking at this, um, should be a little bit bigger. So it prints out a little bit more stretched on the page so that we can read it better. Okay. Now, this one's easier to read. Let's see what happens here. Now, it has picked. Um, our, our, our part of speech labels at the bottom here, proper noun, verb, noun, world, adjective, most powerful. This is labeled as an adverb, which is sort of interesting because it's modifying the adjective. Noun, I probably would have called those both adjectives. Okay. The world here is also what I would have probably 
I mean, it kind of depends on the way that you parse the sentence, right? Whose super compute, whose computer is it? The world's. So it's almost an adjective. It's like a possessive verb uh, noun here. So it's kind of a compound phrase. And what we see is that it says, okay, unveils is tied to us. Okay, it's called, it says compound here. I'm not entirely sure where I'll, why this should be a noun subject. Okay. Worlds here is tied to um, unveils. Okay. This here just makes it possessive. Okay. The possessive link here for supercomputer. And these are just modifiers, adjective and adverb modifiers. So the main word here is the head word. Okay, and this is the child word, but then this one's a head word and a child word. So you have to kind of get used to Spacey's terminology here that anytime you see head, it's talking about um, whichever word is the, the main word and it's child, the one it has the dependency relationship with in the sentence. Now the, the root word in a sentence or that like main head word in the sentence usually is the verb, but each little pairing has a head and a child. The child is the one that's dependent on the head, hence the kind of like terminology being like the adult word <laughs> and the child word. Okay. Um, but this is how it might break down a particular sentence. And this one's kind of complicated because of this extra possessive noun. Okay. Now, Spacey uses this style called clear style for printing dependencies. It's a set of rules on how one transforms the constituency or phrase structure trees that we talked about last week into a dependency graph. Okay. There is an entire article here, the link is still working, right? On clear style de um, dependency conversion. And it is really long and quite dry. But if you're interested in how it converts parse trees, into dependency parsing, because as long as you can make a constituency tree, then you have all the dependencies. You don't have to learn anything special. That's the cool thing about clear style. But oh man, is it dry. So this is the picture that we used before to talk about projective graphs, right? And so it's got examples of how all of these are done. Okay? And then, so I stole one of their pictures to put in here, but you start by inputting a constituency tree, okay? Um, and then, of course, they pick a really strange one. So peace and joy that we want, which is sort of a weird, a weird sentence at all in English, right? We want peace and joy. So it's kind of an inverted sentence, kind of strange, right? Because the verb is here at the end. Um, but the first thing you do is map these empty categories, right? So uh, it rearranges the sentence. We want peace and joy is what we want. So it kind of reorders the sentence to deal with the fact that it's um, a strange sentence, right? And so if I put this into traditional format, I'd say we want peace and joy. Okay. And so it kind of reorganized that, reorganizes um, the sentence to say peace and joy, we want that. Okay, I could also say this, uh, normally you'd have a comma, right? And so we've got the, the noun phrase here underneath a sentence. We want that, right? Noun and verb phrase, cool, cool. And then a, a modifying noun phrase, peace and joy. What is the that that we want? It's the peace and joy. Okay. Now, these special cases here, peace and joy being a strange special case. And so it um, maps the, the sentence based first on um, grabbing the parse tree and dealing with any weird abnormalities and then converting. I would say most of the sentences are not this hard. This is a special case. So let's look at an example. We've talked before about how English is one, la one language, it's three languages and a trench coat pretending to be one, right? And so it's like a German and Latin and a little dash of European something or another. So, you know, English in general is fairly complex and has a lot of weird exceptions. So consider commas. We mostly use commas in certain places to indicate the start of a new phrase, the combination of two sentences for a coordinating conjunction, or just a place where one might take a breath, right? So 
let's say we have these two sentences. I saw a girl with a telescope. This is again that Groucho Marx phrasing, right? I shot the elephant in my pajamas. I saw a girl with a telescope. Who has the telescope? Are you spying on her with your telescope? Or does she have the telescope? Now, if I put a comma here, I saw a girl with a telescope. Okay, it's a kind of an unusual place to put a comma, but it's valid. That almost automatically implies something that the with doesn't go with girl because we've separated them with a comma. Okay. I saw a girl with a telescope. So that pause there implies that you're doing the seeing through the telescope rather than the girl has a telescope. What practically as a computer, should that comma matter? Well, let's see what Spacey does. And so I just plotted both of these sentences and you um, <clears throat> may notice here that they are exactly the same, right? So even though we interpret them differently based on this comma or this pause. If we're speaking, we often pause at commas. Uh, Spacey does not. And so it suggests that the saw here being the main head word has a child in subject I. Saw has a direct object, girl. The, um, here this is D-A-T, or determinant, A. It also has a preposition. I saw, here's my prepositional phrase with the telescope. Prepositional phrase, prepositional object, and determinant. Okay. So you can see how it's very similar to constituency parsing, but instead tells you the relationship between items. So it tells you who the subject of the sentence is, who the actor or thing being acted upon is, girl, and if there are any prepositional phrases. Now, even with a comma, however, we would interpret that differently. Um, Spacing does not. Okay. So how could we use dependency parsing? Like what good does it do? I mean, I've used it for research projects to think about the relationship between words and sentences and how that might tell me something about the meaning of those words in relation to other words, right? So if cat and dog have the same relationship to other words in a sentence, then they're very similar words, right? Um, but we also might use this to think about the way that people are described. So since words will have, you know, nouns will have adjective modifiers, we could go through and instead of just pulling all the adjectives in a sentence, which is one option, we could pull all the adjective modifiers for a specific noun. So you grab the noun and you find all of its children or its ad adjective modifiers. Okay. And what that does is it allows you to see how a specific object in a sentence is described. That's very handy because now we can start to flip through Twitter or Reddit or your favorite news site and start to look at all, instead of just finding all the adjectives in a specific um, document, we can now find all of the adjective modifiers that are particular to our, our choice noun, proper, proper noun. So we're gonna find all the words that are dependent on a specific noun, all the children of those, those words. And we're gonna use the Harry Potter um, package. This isn't the main package, this is like a GitHub package that has um, all of the books in it. So how is the description of Harry, the main character, changed from book one to book last? So what I did was I took um, the first five chapters. This is zero, one, two, three, four, because don't forget your rules for slicing. This is uh, the first number up to, but not including the last number. And each chapter is one object in the list. Right. And so this is, says bring over chapter one. This is actually chapters one through five. And then in the last book, bring over the first five chapters, just so this will run faster. I pasted it all together just to get one big text document. And then I ran my um, imported spacey um, processing on it. Okay, this is the default English model. Now, what I'm gonna do is do a complex loop and find the word, the main head word we're interested in, which will be the noun Harry and find all of its dependent children, which will hopefully be some adjective modifiers. And we could get more specific to only grab the adjectives, but I think these other words are interesting too, because you might be able to see the differences in uh, verb choice. 
So there are some work on gender, the way that people talk about different genders. So you could compare, um, in this case, Harry to Hermione to see if there are differences in the adjectives or verbs that are tied to those, to those characters. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna import counter to keep count. <laughs> this is like the table function in R. Okay, so for each sentence in book one dot sentences, okay, so we're gonna loop over the sentences in the first book. And then each word in that sentence, okay, if the word is Harry, okay, dot string or dot text here, that would be okay as well. If the word's Harry and loop through all the children of Harry, okay, so in a sentence, one word can have multiple dependents. We saw that with the, the last one where the girl with the telescope had multiple, um, the net verb had multiple dependents. Nouns don't always have multiple dependents, but verbs definitely do usually. Okay. So for each child, okay, stick that child in an empty list we have going so we can keep track of them all. Okay. So for each sentence, each word in that sentence, if that word's Harry, save all the children is a little bit of a funny thing to say about this book, but save all of the dependent words tied to Harry. Okay. Now, these are only the things that are dependent on Harry being the noun. We aren't doing it the other way, where Harry is the child. So we could switch it here, where we look at all the words that go that where Harry is the, instead the child, and we're flipping the, the dependency order. But in this case, we're just looking where Harry is the head word and child, and, the, and what are the children words? Counter dot most common will give you a table for my frequency table in descending order. So the most common thing is that it's possessive. Not too surprising. Talk a lot about Harry's stuff, <laughs> his aunt, his, you know, his owl. There's a lot of things that he owns that he talk, they talk about in the book. Um, we get some prep, uh, we get some um, conjunctions and uh, Dudley. Okay, I mean a compound phrase. And poor, here we go. Now we're getting into the, the scripture words. Poor, little, uncle, like believe, spent, bank, can you the second, dangling, moment behind, uh, happy birthday, wizard, finally at the end, uh, expected himself and, and other character names. So what we're seeing is who he's tied to heavily in this first book. Okay, and this is only the first five chapters. And some of the descriptors of him. So let's look at the second book, same loop over the second book. And first of all, notice how many more words there are because there's not as much setup. There's more talk about discussion of the main character here. We're gonna get a ton of different character names. So you can see the character names have changed. Although Hagrid makes an appearance again, Hermione, Dudley, right? Ginny, Uncle, again. Lots of possessives, right? Seven, the number seven, all right? Real, future, uh, let's see, we got any adjectives here. Confused, fake, dressed, true. Okay. So there's a totally different word set. So you can tell there's a big change between the first book and the last book. Okay. This would also work really well if we flipped the modifiers so we could see what words are calling Harry, so to speak. We're not even looking at the type of dependency relationship here, just the words that are linked together. Now there's a bunch of other things that we can do with this, but I will leave that for the assignment where you are essentially counting the dependency relationships or finding specific types of dependency relationships. We're gonna take a switch here and train our own parser. So just like in the last section, this is not as much fun as one would like. It actually has a slightly different form of the training data required, so yay. <laughs> um, but I think it's actually a little bit easier than the training data is necessary for entity recognition. Because in entity recognition, we were doing chunking, we were picking specific character chunks from a sentence. In dependency parsing, we still are doing tokenization, so we're actually just counting the number of words. That's much easier to do than find specific character breaks in a sentence. Okay. So we're going to import random um, to uh, scramble things up. 
and path, I think, to save this out. So first thing you need to do is break down the sentence that you're interested in using as training data or sentences, because you need to understand how Spacey breaks them down so that you can do it in the same way. Mainly here, I want to remind you that in tokenization, Spacey hangs on to the punctuation, and you need to remember that it hangs on to the punctuation or strip the punctuation first. But if you're telling it to break apart sentences, you probably don't want to strip the punctuation. Just don't forget that it's there. So we're going to do they trade mortgage-backed securities. Okay. And what you need to realize is that mortgage-backed comes across as three tokens, mortgage-backed. Okay. And don't forget the period at the end of securities. All right. So it's important to think about how Spacey is going to break this down because you do need to train it in the same way. All right. So this way, I just like used my, my pre-trained model to, to look at how it works, and I printed it back out. You don't really have to do this. This is more of a, just a reminder because we're going to need to know that information to build our training data. All right, so I drew this terrible picture because um, what you'll have to do is actually label these yourself to then put it into the proper format. Because the whole point of training data is that it has the right answer, right? This is a supervised learning task. And so I've got my, my um, print out sentence here in a uh, list format. And there are seven items, but remember the first one is zero. So I just made them all little boxes down here and um, labeled them zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Then the next thing I did was label all the dependencies. So we're going to call trade as our root word, our main head word in the sentence. It is tied to they as an in subject. This is the noun subject for trade. Mortgage-backed securities, mortgage-backed, I'm going to make that as a compound noun modifier. And um, because that's a compound sort of adjective noun phrase, right? Securities is the direct object, which is tied to the root word. And co this compound noun modifier, mortgage-based, modifies securities. Okay. Root word also tends to be linked directly to the punctuation. So then we'll label the number that this item relates to. So once we start um, putting this together in our training format, what we'll do is say that the zero here is related to number one. Number one is related to self, so you just say one. Okay, this one here is tied to four. Three is tied to four. Four is tied to five. And six is tied all the way back to one. So we'll have, if I can do this <laughs> properly, one, one, four, four, five, one, one. Okay, because you you wrote you put in the number of which item it goes back to. It's the child of. Okay. So we have seven items to label, seven dependency labels, and seven numbers marking where they should go. If the number of objects does not match, your code will not run because it needs to have the same number of labels as there are items and the same number of number markers as there are items and labels. So we're gonna say the heads for each um, object, the one is the child of one, one, four, four, five, one, one. So the thing it goes back, it's the child of, we're gonna give those dependencies a label. What kind of dependency are they? So this is a noun subject. This We're going to call this root. You can call it whatever you like, but root makes the most sense to me. A compound punctuation noun modifier, a direct object, and a punctu the, the punctuation. Okay. And so this indicates that first item, the zeroth item, they, is tied to the second item, the once item, trade, and is the subject of that verb. Whereas the direct object here, securities, is tied to being the, um, the direct object, sorry, of that verb. So many words, this is now context dependent grammar, right? We'll have a noun subject, we have our root word as our verb, and our transitive verbs will have a direct object. 
our intransitive verbs will not. So this allows us to start to begin to understand the, the context requirements for our sentences, right? So certain types of verbs require this direct object and other ones don't. And so with dependency parsing, we can figure that out. All right. So here's how we build the training data. We're gonna break this down the same way we did before. It is a list, okay? That's still the same. Let's make this a little bigger. Okay, so it is a list. And the list here has tuple pairs here, just like before. So the first object in the tuple is always the sentence. It doesn't matter if pertaining entity recognition, part of speech tagging, or dependency parsing. The first object in that tuple is always the sentence that you are trying to, or the paragraph or whatever you're trying to break down. The second object is always a dictionary. And so we could combine this dictionary that we have here with an entity's dictionary. So you can have multiple components here in the dictionary. So I could add entities as well. Remember the entities though is broken down by characters, whereas here for dependency parsing, we're breaking this down by token. Okay. And that's the biggest distinction between these two is that the entities have um, you know, a, a, set, a set of tuples, right? The entities are like uh, first character, last character, the type of entity in the tuple count and tuple sets, tuple list, that's the word, tuple list, right? Um, the dependency parsing here has to have two parts. It has to have heads and dependents. Entities is one dictionary entry, entry that is a list of tuples, character start, character end, type of entity. The requirements here for dependency parsing, one more time, is to have the heads and the dependents. If these two things do not have the same number of objects, it will not run properly. This block will run fine because there's no requirements technically on this block. It's not like checking for this. But when you go to train your model, it will be upset with you. It won't run properly. Okay. So the first thing to do always is just count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or use the length function. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Generally, what happens to students right, is that punctuation. You forget about it. Now let's do one more. I like London and Berlin. Okay, like is going to be our root word. So it's our second object here as a root. It's tied to itself. The first word is the noun subject of that root word. So I, so it's time to number one. For London and Berlin, we can treat as one giant direct object. So London being the first direct object and Berlin being a coordinating conjunction. Okay, so I've called that CC and a kind of a conjunction for as part of the direct object. You could also label this as a second direct object. Um, the punctuation again tied back to the front. So what we did here is I like London and Berlin, um, like here, noun um, subject. Then here, this whole phrase, this is the direct object, and Berlin becomes a coordinating uh, conjoined sentence tied to London is how I did it. Right. Now, I could say that Berlin is also a direct object, and the and is just a coordinating conjunction on top of Berlin. So then Berlin would be tied back to to the once object here. So a couple of different valid or legal ways to do this. Um, and it's up to you how you'd like to do it. You don't even need to use the proper labels. You can make up the labels as you go, if you're training your own. So now let's build and train that model. First, we'll do spacey.blank to build ourselves a blank English model, create our parser pipe, Okay, so instead of NER, it's parser. And we add that pipe to our NLP pipeline. Okay, now we've called this NLP like we did before, but now it's a blank model. So it won't run part of speech tagging because we've told it to be blank. Okay, if you want to do the part of speech to figure out the breakdown, you gotta do that before on the English language model. But without any training, it will break down in the, basically the same way. All right, we're gonna add the labels. 
last week we added them manually by using add underscore label. This week, I just wanna show you quickly how to do this more efficiently. For each um, object and annotation in our training data, okay, we're gonna find um, the dependencies block. So basically this says for each, let me back up, this will make a little more sense. For each tuple, right? So there's two tuples, one tuple, two tuples. For each tuple, there's a sentence and then a dictionary. And so that basically says, I don't care about the sentence right now, but I do care about the dictionary. So for each sentence and its annotations, in the annotations.get, .get here allows you to grab the key in the dictionary, find all of the DP, DP keys. Okay. So find them all uh, and grab the list. Okay, so for each dependency, add that label. So what that does is it loops over each tuple, finds this part of the dictionary, and plugs in that whole list into our labels. If they repeat, that's OK, but it adds them all to our, our list of possible labels. And that's going to be much faster for you, because in dependency parsing, there are going to be many more labels. All right. Now let's add one more new concept that we did not talk about last time. Okay, and that's the idea of a loss. In, in Spacey or in many machine learning models, what we can do is see how much the training is helping our model in each round. And so as we talked last week about, maybe I didn't train my model enough to get some of these answers correct. And so, how would I know when I've trained my model enough? Because there is a magic point in these sort of uh, neural net models in which you have trained the model enough and you need to stop because if you keep training it, you will have over overtrained it, okay? And so there's a like this sweet spot where the model has seen enough information, but not too much where that's the only thing it knows. So you're basically trying to, to give it examples and show it the data many times because the idea um, with humans is that we see lots of repeated examples and we learn that way through repeated examples. But you don't want to show it everything too many times because then that's the only thing it'll know and it won't generalize to other similar examples. So we can see how much our model is kind of changing and learning in each round. And so loss is the function that tells you the difference between the previous model round and the current model round. Loss is where, um, is how much our model is changing between those two rounds. Okay. Now it's called, it's called a gradient here. If you look at this picture, this is from Spacey. So we've got some training data with a text and a label. Okay. And so in this case, the text is our sentence and our labels are our dependencies. We've got kind of two parts, the dependency and where, where it goes, the which word it's tied to. So we've got only the label, but also the direction of the dependency, right? But text and a label. There's some sort of, of learning curve that occurs in Spacey. Okay, and this is where they call this the gradient, the idea that there's, it's being trained, right? I think through backpropagation, but don't quote me on that. So it's being trained, it's, it's learning things. And it saves that learning in our model. Then from that, it predicts what label it should have seen. When you predict what label it should have seen, if it gets it right, it strengthens the weights in that neural net. If you get it wrong, it decreases the weights in the neural net. And that's generally how we think people learn too. If you get something right, it strengthens those connections. I got that right, that's correct. If you get something wrong, it decreases those connections. That was wrong, I need to unlearn that. And so loss is how much those weights change. A big loss number means there's a lot of learning going on and you need to give it more learning. Small loss numbers means that the weights are only changing a little bit here and there, and it's probably figured it out. Okay. So the main key thing to understand here is that a loss, big loss numbers mean I need more training, the model's still learning. Small loss numbers mean that the model is settled. Okay. Models that the loss is always large, 
never really learn. And so it's kind of this like loop. Sometimes this, there, there's a special type of math here called the back, called back propagation. That's an example of one of these where it, it, it guesses the answer. If it gets it right, it feeds that information back and strengthens the weights. It guesses the answer. If it gets it wrong, it feeds that information back and decreases the weights, makes them smaller. Don't get it wrong in the same way next time. Um, I'm not sure if that's what Spacey does. I can't remember, but uh, something like that probably. There, there's more than one type of, of math here for this gradient idea, but it's like changing the weights up. If it gets it right, the weights go up. If it gets it wrong, the weights go down. Okay. And then it saves that updated model. And then in the next training round, it does it all over again. Okay. And so this is why you can work with very small training data sets now. I mean, they won't generalize too much, but they will actually learn because it's gonna see the same data over and over again, but that's normal. We see the same data over and over again on a, you know, on a daily basis. So um, yeah, it's unhappy about something. Uh, if, you, if you see this messaging, you can install spacey lookups data. I think I ran this last on my Windows machine, which may not have that, but um, this, it will make this error message go away. Okay. But begin training. Let's just run 20 iterations, just to guess, because I can always start over. If I realize, oh, there's too many, start over. And don't forget, we're only showing you two examples right now. Uh, more complex models have more examples, so you may need less training, or it may need to see them <laughs> more because there's so many different examples. So for um, training round or iter iterator number from one to 20, Okay. Uh, or zero to 20, right? Shuffle the data. So shuffle our training data. It's always a good idea. Save our losses. So we're gonna save the losses as a dictionary. This will actually allow us to see the losses on different parts of the model in different ways. So it may be that your parser is done and fine, but your um, entity recognizer needs more, more time. So you can actually have different training rounds for different parts of the model. We have not combined these together. We've only done one piece at a time, but you could take last week's lecture and this week's lecture and put them together, okay? And train a model to do both at once. Okay. So it'll save the losses as the dictionary. So it's gonna save them for the pipes. We've running a parser pipe. If we did the NER pipe, we'd have both of them on here. For each text and its dictionary, update based on the text of dictionary. And now we've got this new losses piece. Okay. Otherwise, this is all pretty much the same as before. We're just adding in the losses component. And then it'll print out as we go. So what do we see? In 20 rounds, we start with a big number. Now these numbers are, are relative depending on the data, but this is about what you'll see where the numbers are large at first, and then they slowly taper off. Okay, they may go back up a little bit and down. And that is not unusual because we as humans forget stuff all the time. So it's not too surprising that models will forget stuff too. And so it's learning, it's learning, it's learning. You stop using Python for a while. You take a short little break and you come back to it and you're like, what was that thing with pandas again? What was it? So you've forgotten for a little bit. So the loss is higher and then it goes back down. So it isn't too surprising to see these little spikes. What you don't really want to see is it plateauing at a large number, okay, larger than zero. Zero would be no loss. That means it's your model's perfectly trained. It doesn't know anything but the examples. You don't want that. And you want the number to asymptote and be small. Now, how small is small? Just kind of have to run it and see. So in this case, it does look like 20 might be the sweet spot. Maybe you should try running 25 just to make sure that 20 is my sweet spot here. Um, but you know, it's kind of going up and down, up and down, and then it levels off less than one. So that's probably a well-trained tuned model. Um, we could also look at its predictive validity, right? So using it to predict a new test data set to, to make sure that the accuracy is high. So you want losses to be low, but accuracy also to be high because you can train a model really well that isn't any good. <laughs> so we're only doing the looking at losses right now of knowing when to stop training, but we'd also still want accuracy to be high. This is a, a very small training data set. So 
that would be hard to see, but we will look into a different example in a second. Now let's test this model by combining to the two examples from before. So I like securities, right? They trade mortgage-backed securities and um, I like London and Berlin, okay? Or um, something about securities, what do we have? Okay. Yeah, they trade mortgage-backed securities and I like London and Berlin. Now I like securities. Running our NLP on it, and I just told it to all print out. This is a different way to print dependencies. Okay. So we've got our root word and our head word, or we can still use display C, it works fine. And this looks good, right? So I here being the end subject of like, like being our root word, and securities having being our direct object. Okay. And that's all this really says too that I is the end subject of like, like is a root word with itself. Securities is a direct object of like. So that works really well, especially with two examples. Now we could write this model out because then you can update it again later. So you can train a little about, add new, add new information to it, add new examples. So like training isn't a one and done kind of thing. But let's do one more example with a little bit more data and conceptualize how it might be used other than just cool linguistic stuff. So you don't have to use the formal markers. You can, if you're a word nerd, but you don't have to. So you can leverage this system for your own uses. And it doesn't really care, Spacey does not care what labels you give it, just that the formatting, the JSON formatting is correct. You have a list of tuples where the first piece is text and the second piece is a dictionary and the dictionary has some keys that it expects. Cool, so what can I do with that? So we're gonna create our own dependency system that explores the relationship between actions, our verb words, and where an action occurs, a place word, and an attribute or adjective quality of that place. So let's look at some examples here. And in this case, I have a couple of them, right? So here's one tuple, two tuples, three tuples, four, five, oops, sorry, six, seven, I think, examples. Remember that it's a tuple of, of text and then a dictionary, text and a dictionary. And what these are are things that people might say to Siri or OK Google and, um, or type into Google. Right, find a cafe with great Wi-Fi. Okay. And so here we're actually gonna ignore several words. Okay, we're gonna ignore the A because I don't really need it. So we're just gonna mark it out. It's not a word I'm interested in. Okay. And I could tie it to whatever piece I'm, I, I want, but I, I'm mostly gonna ignore the dashes. So we've got the root word here, find. I'm ignoring A but it's technically tied to word number three or the second object, it's the second object, right? So zero, one, two for A, it's the determinant modifier for A with great Wi-Fi, right? So we've tied this to root, a place, the cafe, the quality, great, and the attribute, Wi-Fi. And we're gonna label each one with root, place, quality, and then there's uh, time, so find me the closest gym that's open late. Show me the cheapest store that sells flowers. So we're gonna look at products and locations. And so this would be a really great system if you're trying to figure out what people are searching, right? Or what are the traditional like quality modifiers that people are using? So we've got great here, near, uh, close, cheapest, right? and what are the products we're tying with those words. So this will make a good system where we could actually make a network of the common things that people are asking for. I'm gonna build and train that model. So I've made a second blank model. This all is the same, nothing surprising here. And let's look now at our loss function with more than two data points, okay. So I'm gonna run 20 again. And notice that with more data, I actually need less training. So we were pretty good at whatever point this is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 
11. So I didn't need 20. And notice here that this switches to scientific notation. So these are not getting big again. They're getting very, very small. This would be overtraining. We don't need to keep running that low. We should look at our accuracy levels, predicting new data if we had it, but this is probably too much training. So we probably should have stopped probably about right here. But here's an example of a model that settles fairly quickly because I have more data points. Still only seven, that's not a lot, but you can see that with more data, the model needs less examples or less runs of looking at those examples. But not too unusual to have big losses at the beginning that then taper off fairly quickly. Now let's test our model with three new sentences. Find a hotel with good Wi-Fi. Find me the cheapest gym to work. Find me the show me the best hotel in Berlin. And I can print them out in the kind of fancy format we, we did before, where find is our root word, hotel is the place. Find what a hotel, what about it, quality, um, good Wi-Fi, right? Uh, the hotel's attribute, right, would be Wi-Fi. Or we can print them out in their display C format. Okay, and I had it print um, all three of them. So what are we finding? The place here is a hotel, cool. And the hotel has Wi-Fi, and that Wi-Fi has a quality, it's good. Find what? Gym, cheap gym. Uh, the attributes close to a location work. Okay. One more time, show. So we're doing pretty good because show is a word that we didn't really see a whole lot of before. Show me what? A hotel. Where? Berlin. What kind of hotel? Best. <laughs> so now we can see that this is like, it could also be using a question and answer system. Okay and answer the, the W's, who, what, where, why. All right, I'm gonna save that model out. And if you download the zip file version of this, you can see what it saves in the model file and we can reload those models later. So all together, let's talk a little bit about um, what we've learned. So across both weeks, we have learned a lot about parsing. Parsing can be used in a bunch of different ways. So I could remember from constituency parsing, think about how complex a sentence is by how deep the parse tree goes. We could also look at how, um, how many noun phrases there are, how many verb phrases there are, prepositions, et cetera. And if we can build these parse trees, we can then go the other way where we're putting in words into those parse trees. So we know what are valid combinations of the language we're using. But the limit to that constituency system is that while I know what the patterns of words should be, because I know how to break them down, so I could use it to build back up, that doesn't tell me anything about context. And we can randomly fill in nouns to noun spots and verbs to verb spots, but will it make any sense? No, probably not. And so we might use a a context dependent grammar or dependency parsing, which requires context. So does this verb require a direct object, right? So if I see a lot of examples where that verb has, that root verb has a noun subject and a direct object, I now know something about that verb. I know it needs a direct object. So we can use these two together to start to understand how to build systems that talk back because not only do I know what the structure, the syntactic structure that's legal, I now can leverage dependency parsing to understand the context and know that way, if we pick this verb, it's gotta have this syntax structure because it has to have a direct object. So these two could be used together for systems like chatbots. Now, many people use neural nets for chatbots, but that's what it's learning is these connections of not only the syntax structure, but also the requirements. So when I have this type of, of, when I have this verb, here's structure that tends to go with it. So these two are useful together. Um, and we've only really talked about a few small instances of grammar just in general. Every language is very complex. We can build, remember, endlessly long sentences using the properties of recursion. And so this stuff at the simple level is easy. 
but to build a system that handles all of the different ins and outs of things that we can say is maybe not so easy. Okay? You need a whole lot of training data. And that's why people who write these systems, Apple, Google, Microsoft, can. It's because they have a whole lot of training data. We give it to them every day. Okay? And so that's why it is maybe difficult to scale up one of these systems from the ground up. And my recommendation is to not do that unless you have a very special use case. It's to instead take a pre-trained system like Spacey and add to its training. So load the English module and add your stuff to it rather than start from scratch and hope that it works. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you're trying to build a system that interprets Twitter, it's like half real, insert your favorite language, English, if you want. But you could take Twitter examples and complement the English language model, module that's already there. And one of the best ways to do that might be to see where your model breaks down and give it a whole bunch of examples of what is right when the model is breaking down. Okay. So it is very difficult to scale these models up to an infinite number of grammatical possibilities because of the ambiguity that we tend to speak and type and use in our language um, because that ambiguity in the way that we structure sentences and their semantic context, remember the ambiguity is not only with the, the structure, syntax structure of the sentence, like I shot the elephant in my pajamas, but semantically, we also talk in fairly ambiguous terms by using phrases like that, he and she, who is he, who is she, that kind of thing. So ambiguity causes this compounding problem and dealing with recursion uh, and creativity is also uh, harder to do. We talked in our name, uh, named entity recognition section about how those systems are very brittle. They only work on what you've trained them on. This is a little bit better. These systems do tend to work on newer data sets. The more similar, the better. But since syntax is fairly consistent in the sense that, um, as long as you're training it on syntax that it's going to see again, syntax is somewhat consistent. <laughs> um, they are less brittle than named entity systems. So they do tend to generalize OK. Um, but you're not going to, if you're training it on English literature and then trying to test it on Reddit, that's not going to work. <laughs> but if you're training it on um, lots of informal speech and then testing it on Reddit would probably work okay. Now there are entire projects devoted to entity um, dependency parsing, okay? And so they have really fun names like the Lexical Functional Grammar Pargram Project. That's not a typo, that's correct. <laughs> Head-driven phrase structure grammar, which is um, uh, thinking about the, the root words, right? Lexical, lexical, lexical eyes, tree adjoining grammar project. So these are some of the big projects that think about dependency parsing and how we would uh, write systems that do dependency parsing out in the wild okay, that um, many things like Spacey are based on, right? So we learned a whole lot about parsing and sentence structure, which will be really important if you're wanting to write a system that talks back. <laughs>